glacier, the glacier will create a U-shaped valley. All right, so it's it's not going to create as sharp of a, a cut here in the mountains because the snow is thicker and moves slower. Okay, now it comes down, and we have a couple other features down here that I want to point out. This is a kettle lake, and a kettle lake forms when you've got a big block of ice or something that's in the snow, and the snow melts, so the snow's, snow's receding, but the block of ice is so heavy that it sinks into the, the light dirt there, and so it creates kind of a hole, and then it melts, and so you've got a hole there because the ice sunk, and then it melts, and so now it's water, and so you get what are called kettle lakes. Um, you've also got uh, little pieces that we call um, moraines. Moraines generally occur at the end. This is an end moraine. The end moraine shows how far the glacier went. Okay, so it went all this way, and then as it's as the glacier's flowing, right, it pushes till it pushes sediment and till and creates basically a, a little hill or a moraine at the end. Okay, and the, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the drumlins, which is these right here. Now, a drumlin is basically, it's a smoothed out hill in the direction of the flow of the, the glacier. So as it went over this area, it smoothed out the, the, uh, the land, just like in a river, rocks get smooth and rounded because they're inside getting worn down. Okay, so those, that's the difference between rivers and and uh, glaciers. Now here I just want to point out the different ways that a stream can cause erosion. You can have small pieces of sediment that actually dissolves, which is going to float along with the water. You can also have smaller pieces of sediment that are small enough to be picked up and carried by the river. Now here's where the speed of the river really has a big important impact. Because if the river's flowing really fast, then it's going to be able to pick up some medium-sized particles. Now depending on how big it is, it may be small enough to flow with the water. If it's not, then maybe sometimes it's going to come down, it's going to bounce, and every time it bounces, it's going to kick up a little bit of dirt, causing more sediment to be carried around. Or it could hit these other bigger rocks, right, and that's what causes the big rocks to smooth out, is all this sediment flowing by and the medium-sized particles hitting it. Now, the big particles, the big rocks, sometimes they move, sometimes they don't, again, depending on how fast the river's moving, but it could just be pushed right along the bottom here very slowly, or depending on how many medium-sized particles hit it, it could get pushed along even even harder, even faster. Okay, caves and sinkholes actually start with the rain. Okay, so we're going to talk for a minute about caves and sinkholes. So the rain is H2O. Now most of the rain actually gets down to earth as H2O, but some of it actually mixes with carbon dioxide, which is in the air, the CO2, and when you get those mixed up together, you get what we call carbonic acid, which is h 2 CO3. You can see how you got three oxygens, a carbon, and two hydrogens there. And carbonic acid is slightly acidic. If you drink it, it's not going to hurt you because it's close enough to base to, to uh, being neutral that it's not going to hurt you. However, some types of rocks will actually dissolve with a little bit of of uh, acidity. Something quite this small, like uh, limestone, is is uh, one of the few, one of the types that will dissolve rather readily. And so as it's happening. Uh, then the carbonic acid can get into the ground, get into the rocks, and cause the rock to dissolve. As the rock dissolves, then that means that it will then create a cave. Now I'm going to have to stop it, because I'm out of time.